Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am so excited to be here with you tonight. My name is Rebecca Koronowski, and I am the engagement coordinator for Jefferson Land Trust, here to serve up some geology to you all. Uh, before I pass it over to Michael, I just want to give a couple of uh, heads up on some tech tools that will help you to have a good experience as we're all here together tonight. So for the duration of the presentation, the majority of our participants will all uh, remain on mute so that we can keep the audio interference down and give uh, Terry and Michael a chance to uh, have their voices heard. Um, but I do want to point out that in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, uh, regardless of what type of a device you're on, there is a button for starting and stopping your video. Um, and that is just to the right of the mute button. If you're on a device, you may need to tap your screen in order to get those controls to show up. Um, and that start and stop video button is there for you if you'd like to remain off camera during the presentation. It's nice to see everyone's faces if you want to leave your camera on. Um, it's good to have the heads nodding along and, and laughing along as we have our presentation. But if you'd prefer to be off camera, or you need to step away, you can just push that stop video button and that'll turn off your camera. And then when you're ready to turn it back on again, you can just push that button one more time. Um, and that doesn't leave the meeting, it just turns your camera off. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that this presentation will be doing some screen sharing. And so it's possible that when Terry starts his screen share that you may need to adjust your view slightly in order to get um, the best experience. And so in the upper right hand corner, if you're on a computer or if you're on a phone or tablet, swiping left or right, will allow you to change settings. I am certain that for the majority of you, once we get rolling, everything will look just fine. Um, but if there are some floating heads that are on top of the screen, share that you don't want to be there. You can click in the black bar that's above the floating heads that will move it around. So if Terry's covering up one of his slides, just drag him over to somewhere else so that uh, you can see what he's showing you. Um, and additionally, in Zoom, we have the opportunity to chat with each other. Some of you are um, already doing so down in the chat box there. This is the place where we'll collect questions from you that Michael will be posing to Terry towards the end of the event. Um, but this is also where you can check in if you have any tech issues or um, just have a comment to share. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, or if you are on a device pushing the more button, will pull up a menu and either way you wanna pick chat. And then this is where you can chat to everyone. And that'll pop up on the screen. Um, and then finally, I just want to announce that we are recording this presentation. And so if you want to come back for more and watch it again, or you want to share it with your friends later who didn't get a chance to participate, we'll be uh, recording this for you and sending out some links via the geology, Quimper Geology listserv here. And I think with that, I will pass it on over to Michael Machette, president of Comfort Geological Society. Take it away, Michael. Hey, thanks for coming today. You didn't even have to get out of your chair to make this lecture, so that's pretty good. Uh, we're broadcasting from the international headquarters of the Quimper Geological Society here in Port Townsend, in Washington. And uh, first off, I'd like to just do a little bit of business. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this lecture on geology. This is the first lecture of our 2020 to 21 season, and it's also our first attempt to go virtual. So please uh, watch out for the road bumps. We'll miss, uh, we all miss the in-person lectures that we were having at the Port Townsend High School, but with this COVID-19 virus still raging, this will be our new normal for a while. On the plus side, the virtual lecture allows us to reach a really wide audience with close-up graphics and high quality sound. In terms of lectures, I'd like to announce a few other ones that might be of interest to you coming up in the next month. On October 8th, I'm giving a presentation on the soils and geology of the Port Townsend area for the Master Gardeners here in Quimper Peninsula. 
the email announcement will go out on our bulk mailer pretty quickly. Then on November 3rd, Paul Lubert from our advisory board will start a six week long series of lectures for the QUUF's adult learning program. And this is a free uh, lecture series. The series will focus on grand themes and earth history and will be co-authored by Paul, Keith Norland, and George Stanley. Again, an email will go out towards the end of October. And finally, on November 14th, Pat Pringle will make his third attempt to present a very interesting talk on buried and submerged forests of the Pacific Northwest, which witness our witnesses to ancient earthquakes, landslides, and volcanic eruptions. His abstract is already on our website. Before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to thank Rebecca at the Land Trust for helping be our Zoom facilitator this fall. Without her help, we'd have a much less professional experience today. And as she said earlier, if you have any questions, just post them in the chat room. I'll collect them up towards the end and recast them to Terry for his responses. About Terry. Terry uh, Wallace was raised in Los Alamos, New Mexico and graduated from the Los Alamos, Los Alamos High School in 1974. He earned a bachelor's of science degree in geophysics and mathematics from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, followed by a master's of science and a PhD in geophysics from Caltech. Uh, from Caltech. Then from, 2000, uh, from 1983 to 2003, 20 years, he was a professor at the University of Arizona. In 2006, Jerry, uh, Terry heard the call home and moved back to Los Alamos to become Lanel's Principal Associate Director of Science, Technology, and Engineering, then the Principal Associate Director for Global Security. He served as 11th Director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory until his retirement two years ago. He's kind of a big gun, right, Terry? <laughs> In his off time, Terry's a marathon style wilderness runner and avid hiker. He's also a mineral, mineral, serious mineral, mineral collector, a hobby fostered by his father from an early age. Terry's visited mining communities and mineral locations across the Americas and has written extensively on various aspects of mineralogy for amateurs. He's the author of a popular mineral book called Collecting Arizona. As you suspect, gold is one of his favorite minerals. So without further ado, Here's Terry Wallace speaking on gold, a journey from the Big Bang to the Amazon. Terry. Well, uh, good morning or afternoon, actually. It's hard to tell in electron space. Um, unfortunately, we're, uh, I'm gonna have to take this, everything worked perfect until I fooled around. And it's not Rebecca's fault, it's my fault. Um, today, I'd like to talk about something that I think probably everybody here knows something about, namely gold. Uh, but I wanna talk about this amazing element from a different perspective, namely what it tells us about our planet. It's fairly natural for the kind of the more academically inclined in the mineral community and geology uh, to look beyond the physical aspects of some mineral specimen and ponder what its implications are, both in terms of geology and perhaps in terms of human aspects of mining and curating a specimen. Mineral specimens are the uh, tactile gateway to the science of mineralogy, but they're also, for people like me, uh, a gateway to things like atomic physics. And certainly, when we put it all together, there's something in connection to human history and gold and the Earth. So I'd like to talk about gold in a real broad context. Namely, this remarkable collection of what I can frankly only call miracles that are required for gold crystals to even exist on our planet. In my hand here, so this is the value of having a virtual presentation, are three spectacularly large gold crystals. They were found in 2015 uh, in the westernmost part of Brazil pretty close to the Bolivian border, uh, in the state of Mato Grosso, near a town of Puntas de la Cerda, and hence the Amazon part of our talk. Uh, these crystallized gold turn out to be some of the largest single crystals that have ever been found. They're complex structures, so you may not recognize them immediately as single crystals, uh, but we'll look at that. They're surely very rare, but the question is, how do they get to the jungles of the Amazon? And what does it say about you and I as earthbound creatures? Well, the Earth is a spectacularly dynamic planet. It's ever-changing, it's evolving, 
And it's certainly unique within our solar system. We have plate tectonics, we have oceans teeming with life, an atmosphere that looks nothing like anything we see in our solar system, and certainly not like the exoplanets that have been trumpeted as Earth-like, uh, orbiting distant stars. In many respects, this ever-changing world can be characterized as a lock. And just as we look at our own DNA as for clues on why and what we are as humans, uh, we can look at minerals on Earth as a type of celestial DNA. Uh, there are a little over 5,400 recognized mineral species on Earth. By mineral species, we mean a material that's naturally occurring with a defined chemical structure and with a specific ordering or atomic crystallized structure. A mineral is an element or chemical compound. It's normally crystalline and it's there because of a geologic process. Now the periodic table that some of the elements we know about is like the lineup of the genes that are assembled to make a strand of DNA. So if I look at any of those particular elements, and I've circled the elements, which are really kind of the most interesting to me, because when we put them together as things, we make minerals, which you could think is the DNA. So uh, we have the coinage metals. That's copper, silver, and gold. They're kind of there in the middle of that periodic table. And we're going to concentrate on gold for some really interesting reasons. But we have a couple other really interesting minerals that are going to be related to things that are happening with gold. For example, the platinum group minerals. And those are the ones that are located in that red circle that are just to the left of the coinage metals. And then I'm going to talk a lot about iron because it has uh, something to do with the way the earth is formed and a little bit about lead, which is circled over there on the right hand side. So I'd like to take kind of a journey through that and show you that just as we are when we try to solve a human mystery, we often use DNA for forensics analysis. So we're gonna do some forensics reconstruction of the earth by looking at its DNA, namely minerals. So if I look at minerals, I wanna show you a couple things on this chart. The first thing is over on the right hand side, is a timeline. And on that chart shows you the number of minerals through time on Earth. And so when the Earth was first being formed, maybe five and, or 4.5 billion years ago, we had maybe 60 species of minerals. And as we began to have things happen on the Earth, as it cooled and we began to have fractionation, the growth of continents, we got more and more minerals. And so we got up to on the order of maybe 1,000 or 1,200 minerals about 3 billion years ago. Guess what? That's the most minerals we see anywhere else in the solar system. Uh, on Venus, it's a little hard because of a thick atmosphere, but we see about 700 minerals from spectroscopy that we look at when we examine it with spacecraft. On Mars, maybe a few more, but way less than anything else we have on Earth. But on Earth, we had something spectacular happen about two and a half billion years ago, and that's called the Great Oxidation Event. And that is life began to occur on Earth, and through that, we began to change our atmosphere so we had oxygen. And oxygen is an incredibly corrosive, but competitive metal, uh, material, which allows us to make many more minerals. And uh, today, of course, we're up to 5,400, and like I said, it's almost an order of magnitude larger than we see anything else in the, on any planet in our solar system. In the upper left-hand corner is a meteorite. That happens to be the Diablo Canyon meteorite, or slice of it, and it looks like Swiss cheese. That meteorite was used by Claire Patterson in 1954 and 55 to actually date the Earth. And what he did is he took small samples from each one of those little cheese holes and uh, they contain different iron bearing minerals and in them are lead isotopes and that's because this meteorite used to contain some uranium and that uranium decayed and by looking at the lead isotopes we can get a good age of that meteorite and use that as a proxy to date the earth and claire patterson was able to determine an earth age of 4.56 billion years we haven't changed the date since he did that some 70, almost 70 years ago. And so the first forensic analysis we had, we have minerals, which actually then can be used to tell us when the time clock of the crime, i.e. the beginning of our Earth began. Right below that is a mineral which has only been around for about 120 years. It's called Simon Colite. It's a zinc 
uh, chloride, very complicated mineral, it only forms in dry environments in extinct mines. And so it's definitely one that occurs since man has had an impact on the planet. There's about 250 of those kind of minerals, which I would call anthropogenic minerals. And so I can use that as the other end of the spectrum and begin to say, well, why do I have that mineral? What does it mean about the impact of what man is doing? So let's get back to gold and look at his journey. Uh, there's no metal, there's no mineral that evokes more emotion than mankind. It has this kind of warm glow that captures the eye. Uh, if you hold a gold crystal, or a nugget from California or the Yukon, it's most likely to evoke a response from you or whoever's holding it as beautiful. And certainly perhaps no material object comes closer to the sort of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato's concept of true beauty is universal. But this veneer of beauty hides a scientific story that's pretty incredible. The gold nugget or the crystal is made of stuff that could not have been born on our planet or even our solar system. It can only be made in the most extreme forges of the universe and has traveled through interstellar material only to be gathered by a gravitational storm that built our solar system some four and a half billion years ago. Now, some modest amount of gold atoms collected in the rocky rubble that became the Earth. And finally, this was concentrated in ores through our plate tectonics and volcanic processes. It probably was erupted in veins, which were eroded and eventually were put in streams and gravels and then collected. And these ores were eroded, as I said, and picked up and we looked at and somebody said they were beautiful and they had value, even though the concept of having a rock have truly value in human history is a strange change that was actually quite important. Now, I show that kind of with that circular diagram there. We're gonna go back in this lecture and start at the Big Bang. So we're gonna to try to compress all 13.8 billion years into 50 minutes, okay? But I'm pretty good at like skipping lots of stuff. And what we're gonna find out that we're gonna have the gold that came here is going to come through an incredibly complicated uh, cosmological process. And it's gonna come from gases which were exploded out of a kilonova only to have some gravitational event occur which causes some of those gases to collapse again to build our solar system, and then to grab our geology. And then these two dudes that are over here on the left-hand side are prospectors in the Yukon which able to find a crystal like we see in the middle. And so the story is actually quite complicated. Now gold has been a coveted item in terms of humanity forever. Let's get some basics about it. It's only one of about a dozen naturally occurring metals that we can also call minerals. Most minerals uh, are a metal combined with an oxygen or a sulfur or an arsenic. Uh, now, all the metals share some similar properties. At the molecular level, they have a metallic bond, and that means they share free electrons in their lattice. And so they're able to conduct electricity. That means they probably shine. Uh, that means that uh, they can probably be fairly ductile, meaning they can be stretched. These simple facts uh, dictate the characteristics when we think about gold. It's relatively soft, shiny, and a good conductor of electricity. Its density is 19 and a half times that of water. So if you picked up a gallon jug of water at the store and tried to hold it out here in your arm, you can do that, it weighs about eight pounds. If you took that same jug and you filled it with gold, it would weigh 155 pounds. Pretty hard to hold out unless you really got good abs. The first time that we saw really gold in something in terms of humanity was about 7,000 years ago. And uh, obviously it was in the geologic environment, but um, humanity didn't interact with it until a spectacular archeological find in Bulgaria uh, in the early 1970s. And uh, there was uh, basically a cemetery that was accidentally uh, excavated when they were doing construction. And it contained a large number of graves. And it was known for the town that's there now, which is Varna. 
we don't probably recognize that when we talk about gold history, but the Greeks referred to this place as Odessus. And so when they found these graves, they found about 13 pounds of gold that was in various ornamental configurations. And you can see uh, the most famous of these graves here, which has actually eight pounds of gold in it. Before this time, we can, we, in, from an archaeological perspective, have never found more than a total of a pound of gold that was used by humanity for ornamentation. But clearly, suddenly on this screen was this powerful metal. Next to this is a small slab of a recreation of a series of cuneiform rules. These are known as the uh, Hernabi rules or laws. And I chose this particular cuneiform section because it has a bunch of things about a shekel. A shekel is the first measure or weight which was assigned to take metal value so you could actually add value to other things. And in the series of laws, it says, if you commit a crime, you owe three shekels of gold or 12 shekels of silver, for example. And it was the beginning of our monetary system and our monetary system was pegged to gold. What is that monetary system really mean? It's a remarkable thing for humans to suddenly decide the metal has value and we can assign that value to any other things. It actually is the introduction of trade and the idea that you could have something that keep uh, an accounting of uh, as you trade wheat, no matter where it is at. And it started modern civilization. But where did that gold come from? So when we think about that, um, I want to go back and start this at this Big Bang. And so whenever I talk about these kinds of things, everybody says, well, what happened right before the Big Bang? That's off the table, guys. I don't know, okay? I actually don't know what happened right at the Big Bang. But after the Big Bang occurred, and I mean fractions of a second, we begin to see things in our universe that we can begin to understand. So this Big Bang created everything that we know today but when it first created it, it wasn't created in the way that you or I would relate to it. In the first few seconds, the sudden explosion created all this material, but it was made of hadrons and leptons and bosons, the fundamental building blocks for the things that we usually think about when we think about atoms of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But it was really, really hot. It was almost a billion degrees Kelvin in temperature. So we're spewing out this material through space, but we're doing it at a rapid rate and that's expanding. So as it expands out, it cools. After a few seconds, really, it cools enough that these building blocks begin to form the particles that we're most more used to, that's in particular protons and some electrons. Finally, after many minutes, we begin to form maybe the first atoms. So the first atom would be one proton and one electron. So a positive electric, uh, a negative system operating in concert. And so we begin to build hydrogen. After that, maybe some helium. Finally, maybe some lithium. But that's all we did with the Big Bang. And so it spewed out this gas, and this gas cools, and we have a few elements. As we have a few of those elements begin to move out, sometimes something disturbs this universe. And some of those elements then get close enough together that they exert an attraction on each other, which is a gravitational attraction. And that gravitational attraction pulls that hydrogen, that helium, maybe a little lithium back together. And given the magnitude of the time that we have available, it squeezes in and it's put more material, greater gravitational attraction, and we build the first star. And so when we're somewhere between 60 million and 150 million year, we're making some stars. What are stars? We've taken so much of this hydrogen and we squeeze it together. The two hydrogens are gonna to wanna to combine and when they do that, we have fusion. And fusion makes a new element and energy 
therefore the heat of the stars. That's kind of the beginning of what happens in the solar system. So if I, or universe. So when I think about a star, I've got this big mass of gas. It's compressing down. When it compresses down, it makes new elements. So if I take two protons and take two electrons, I make helium. But if I take two heliums, two protons, another two protons and put them together, then I can make neon. And eventually I can make carbon. And the way I do this, of course, is by squeezing this material. So I put a cross section here of kind of a typical star. There's a whole class of stars, but they all operate more or less the same. And so we're making a bright star, sending out wonderful heat, but inside is what's happening is we're making a fusion. And it's really a pretty interesting thing. But this is a really complicated process and comes down to limits of actually how we look at forces in those atoms. This is called nucleosynthesis. And so the left-hand side there shows you an example of the nucleosynthesis, adding three heliums together to make a carbon. And when we squeeze those together, a tiny amount of mass is missing. That mass turns into energy. And that's Einstein's equation, e equals mc squared. Okay, so that tiny amount of mass that goes away when we squeeze those four uh, or three uh, helium atoms together is the thing that makes the energy, which is the heat that we see. But what's happening when we do that is we have multiple things which are competing. So we come together and those atoms want to come together in what we call a binding energy process. But remember, all those protons have the same charge. It's a plus charge. And everyone who's taken a magnet and will take the two positive poles and try to push them together, the magnets want to push apart. Same thing happens in electric systems. We have positive uh, particles. We try to push them together. They're going to want to push apart. So we have a binding energy that wants to pull us together. And then we have a process that wants to push us apart, which is what we call the, <clears throat> excuse me, the atomic forces. And so as we squeeze these together, we can make new elements until we get to iron. And iron is the only, the largest element we could do before the nucleus says, I'm not taking any more positive stuff. And so we end up with uh, a system in stars that we can't get any better than iron. So, Luckily, when that happens, we have some interesting things. The star eventually dies. It's a big iron clunk. But that iron keeps pressing down. And as it keeps pressing down, it eventually explodes because it doesn't know what else to do with itself. It makes a supernova. And what's left over is material that's so compressed that the protons and the electrons have combined to make neutrons and we end up with a neutron star. A neutron stars are pretty spectacular things. Okay, these neutron stars typically are about, oh, uh, somewhere between, I don't know, 10 and 30 masses of our sun, but they're actually smaller than our sun. They're much smaller. They're only about 10 kilometers across. So about Manhattan size. But they have 30 masses of our sun which is mainly just neutrons, okay? If you took a tablespoon and you dug it into that mass, it would weigh 10 million tons. So you have this incredibly massive object out in space. And this is the going to be where the story is going to get really interesting. But before we can go in and understand what happens in this great universe we have, I want to go back to a few basics about gold so we can build on that. I call it the power of gold. Like I said, it's a great conductor of electricity. And what you see right in the middle of this figure is sort of the classic Niel Bohr diagram trying to describe what an atom looks like. And of course, it has nothing to do with what an atom really looks like, but it's a nice graphical representation. In the center, we have pro uh, protons and neutrons. And in this case, we have 79 of these protons. And around this, we have electrons interacting. 
and their shells are defined by energy, not circular orbits like we like to draw this. But because of that, we have some incredible complications. Now, these orbits are being pulled in, the electronic charge being negative and the nucleus positive. So they're moving at almost the speed of light. And that's why gold is yellow. We get a shift in the colors that are coming back when we reflect. But it also means that when we try to pull this stuff apart, it's going to want to stay together. So we could take a single ounce of gold. So if I look at a single ounce of gold, that's like five order wedding rings for men. And we pull it, we can make a, a single wire, and we have made them, that's only five microns thick and stretches 50 miles. So gold is this kind of really amazing material with this interaction between this. The crystal structure of gold is pretty simple. It's uh, basically an arrangement of atoms that we call body center cubic coming down. So we expect sort of cubic crystals. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. But think about to get there, we have an individual atom interacting with both these protons, electrons, and neutrons. So let's go back to the neutron stars. And now I'm gonna take you into some nuclear physics. And so I don't want anybody to get up for any like cup of coffee because this is the best part, all right? Now, how do we make new elements? Well, we just talked about nuclear synthesis and we squeeze some things together. We can do that on Earth in big colliders. And so if you look at the CERN collider, we can collide different elements. But in general, the way we do this is with cyclotrons and cyclotrons will spin a particle around and we'll put it into the nucleus. And uh, what we may do is we add a proton to uh, the nucleus of an atom, and of course, it's going to go up one in a weight. Another way to do this is neutron. But if you put a neutron on there, it's not changing the atomic number, except that in unstable environments, neutrons decay. And when they decay, they produce a proton plus a neutrino. But the decay process is pretty unstable. And so for us to do that, we have to be able to flood something with neutrons and then be able to see some decay and make new elements. And so we have a process which we call the R process, rapid neutron capture. It makes an unstable nucleus that decays to a new, much heavier element. This is not the nucleosynthesis that we can get from a star. We have to be able to flood an environment with neutrons. We just told you we had a great environment for neutrons, and those are neutron stars. So if we take a neutron star and collide it with another neutron star, we get really cool stuff. Now, the, what I'm showing here is a neutron star, neutron star dance. If you go over into A, you see two neutron stars, they can feel a gravitational attraction a long ways away. Uh, gravity is a kind of complicated thing, we like to think of gravity mainly as sort of one of those things that we imagine from Newton when an apple bonks him in the head. And so we think of it as like a pulling force. Actually, that's not what gravity is at all. Gravity is actually the shape of space. And the presence of the mass changes the shape of space. So it's like having a flat sort of trampoline, but if you put a bowling ball on that, that trampoline shape changes. That's where gravity is. So in this case, they had two bowling balls. The two neutron stars are changing the shape of space. And pretty soon, those two dips are going to basically intersect. And they're slowly going to come together and spin around each other through B and C. And we have a collision of neutron stars. And when neutron stars collide, incredibly dynamic things happen. First of all, you got neutrons everywhere. And so those neutrons are able to seed and build new atoms and flood other atoms with electrons, I mean neutrons. And we have a tremendous amount of ejecta that moves away from this. We spew stuff out into space. And this is where gold and platinum are made. And they can only be made in this incredibly strong, 
furnace in which we're squeezing this material together during a collision. Now, all this that we can do, we knew about in the 60s, theoretically. And so it was some physicists sitting around and basically came up with a great model and could show you from Schrodinger's equation, this is what has to happen. But we couldn't verify it. But it turns out Einstein was right about lots of stuff. And one of those things was the idea of gravity waves when you shake the space of the universe. When you take two massive objects, like these two bowling balls of neutrino, uh, neutron stars, and you collide them, you make a disturbance, and that rug or that trampoline wiggles and it's felt all the way through the universe. We produce what's known as a gravity wave. And again, we had not seen gravity waves, but uh, we built two instruments, or in the US at least one instrument, that looked for what a gravity wave would look like. And so a gravity wave, you can imagine as we do this ripple, and it comes by is everything gets squeezed together as the ripple comes, and everything goes back out. So if a person asks you, if you You've ever ridden a gravity wave? The answer is yes, because every time one comes through the earth, you're actually getting stretched out a little and squeezed together a little. Now, it's a pretty darn small amount. In the, you know, it's, it's uh, a nanometer at most. So this instrument that goes from basically a light beam or a laser beam from Louisiana to Hanford, Washington, measures the shape of the earth. And it turns out in 2017, we actually captured two neutron stars colliding. And so this is uh, known as SSS 17A event, and it was on the 21st of, of uh, August. And when these things collided, this wiggle appeared, changing the shape of the Earth. And the astronomers told all the people that had optical telescopes, those things that were more used to look like when we're looking at telescopes, something occurred out in this sector of space. And they also knew because we have a second instrument sort of like this in Europe, where more or less to look. And we actually captured the stars colliding. And that star collision process gave us a chance to actually see the material that was spewed out into space. And as it was spewed out into space, we could actually predict what it looked like, its spectra. And from that, we could actually see gold and platinum actually coming away from this neutron star collision. The total amount of gold that was spewed out in a couple days from this collision was something like 400 times the mass of Earth today. Platinum even more. That's a huge amount of material. And so every time we have one of these kind of collisions, we produce a lot of gold. Unfortunately, the universe is really big. So even if you produce a lot of gold, it's still spread out over a long ways. So Sir Francis Bacon, who created the scientific method, noted that in between stars, there was this great emptiness. And he came up with what he called the interstellar sky. So this collision that occurred in 2017 has spewed out this material, but it's spewed it out in space. And in space, it's been distributed as this distrib cloud of material that has basically the same density as you would expect if you could take our sea level, basically pressure from the atmosphere, and dilute it one trillion times. So almost nothing's there, but there's something. And some of that is gold. Well, the universe is expansive, and it does have things happen to it. And occasionally, just enough stellar material collects to begin to start that process of sending a signal around and a gravitational attraction begins to occur. So sometime, probably on the order of five billion years ago, some material began, enough material began to collect in our own solar system 
that we formed a cloud. And that cloud began to cause attraction that began to come back in. Somewhere around 4.65 billion years, we had enough material coming together that we could build a star, our sun. But there was still a lot of other material around spinning in to come into this material. And of course, when we go to B or C, some of that leftover material is going to coalesce into what we call planetoids, and we're going to eventually make the Earth. The whole time it takes to go from having the star to beginning to make the planets is tens of millions of years. So compared to the expanse that we have to finally have begin to build a star, we actually build a solar system rather quickly. So one of those planets, of course, was ours, was Earth. And we created enough material. And that's where we only have a few minerals when we do this. As we continue to bring this together, it's incredibly violent business. And this violent business is little particles slamming into each other. The potential energy that was associated with them moving gets converted to heat. And we begin to make a little mound of material, but it's also heating up. The heating up of that material breaks down whatever that rock was, and we begin to have a fractionation of our planet. And one of the elements that we get from all those stars, of course, is iron. And iron is the heaviest of the most of those elements. And so as we begin to heat this up, it sinks to the middle of this hot mass, which will become the Earth, and we make a core. And eventually, we actually have a planet that has a core that's primarily iron. Then we have, as we move out, uh, a mantle. And that mantle is, still has some iron in it, but it's lost most of it to the core. And then a crust, the cooling material that's around the outside. Now, this process itself is complicated. And one of the complications is, as the iron goes towards the core, it tends to pull with it what we call siderophile elements. And guess what? Gold is a siderophile element. So we had a lot of gold when we stirred and made the earth, but we all sent it to the core. And today, 99.6% of the gold on earth is in the earth's core. So if you could dig a hole, you know, roughly 1,700 kilometers deep, you would find a lot of gold. So we didn't have much gold on the surface of the earth, but the earth, the young solar system was pretty violent. And we continue to have meteorite impacts. Those meteorite impacts carried the former cores of little planetoids in other places and deposited some gold back on our surface. They also, when they struck the Earth, began plate tectonics, which is the great mixing engine which makes our planet so unique. If we look at the cosmic abundance of elements, and this is a logarithmic scale, so I don't have to tell anybody about logarithmic scales now that we have COVID. Okay, so everything that we do with infections is always a logarithmic scale. So on this logarithmic scale, of course, the thing if we look at, at the cosmic abundance, 75% of the mass of the universe is hydrogen. And we look as we come down here, they decay. And you see an up, down, up, down, up, down. And you will find out that uh, if you have an even number of protons in the nucleus, it's a little easier to stay together than if you have an odd number. And so that's the, uh, basically what you see as it moves back and forth here. But you can see that if, from a solar system perspective, when you get over those heavy elements well below iron, uh, there's not much material. There's something like, if you look at that, something like a trillion times less I, uh, uranium than there is hydrogen. But let's look at the Earth's crust. And now let's look at particular in gold. Same kind of plot. There's a logarithm there. The atomic number Z just tells you what uh, the element is. What you can see is gold is the 72nd uh, most common. And it's really not that same sort of decay we saw. And that's because so much of our gold disappeared to the Earth's core. So there's a little bit of gold, but it's not very common. And so if we come back here, we normalize this to silicon. And the reason we choose silicon, if you look up there, oh, the two most common elements are silicon and oxygen. And therefore, the most common crustal mineral is quartz. We have to see, well, why do we get the gold? Well, thank God for plate tectonics. Because we take this incredibly uncommon 
mineral, which has also an element, gold, and we concentrate it by melting material and letting the gold recollect with itself. And we erupt it into the different types of deposits. But the key here is plate tectonics. And what we're gonna see is whenever we bring and melt rock in a large scale, we have to have a collision between basically a subducting plate and an overriding plate. And almost all our gold deposits are made by that. And they recollect the rather rare gold and put it in deposits, which we can eventually find. This is gold from the second most famous gold rush in US history, that's the Klondike in 1899. And so I'm gonna collect this together in a geologic deposit, but I'm gonna make new crystals. We showed you early on, they're cubic. These are all in the cubic class, although more often than not, they're octahedrons. So before we can complete this full journey picture to understanding, we ask, well, what does the crystal structure tell us about what's happening on Earth? So I wanna ask, just give you a little few basics on crystal growth. Crystal growth is really a fascinating topic. But what we find is that we have a driving function, which is basically how fast a crystal grows, versus some other kind of material. And when we look at that, uh, we have different shapes. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense to most people, so we're gonna look at the most common mineral we can find in nature that grows, and that's ice. Okay, so ice is a great way to look at how minerals grow or don't grow, because we see it every year when it snows. And down at the bottom is temperature, so that's the driver here, versus how much it's saturated. And so how, what's the humidity? And what you can see is the crystal structure of ice changes as we change the temperature or the saturation. So if we're not too cold, just a little bit of freezing and pretty high saturation, we get over there some wonderful snowflakes. But if we're really, really cold and we're in Antarctica, we don't get much snow, but if we pick up the snow, they're hollow little tubes. And so by looking at the crystal structure, I can tell you when it was formed, what the temperature was, and what the saturation was. So I have a forensic indicator. So let's go back to gold and see what that means. Gold, which we see is always when it forms a crystal, each one of these crystals is from that Brazilian deposit I talked about, shows a complex structure. And that complex structure is what we call hopper. And so what it's telling me is those crystals grew fast. And that's because the edge of the crystals grow out faster than the face of the crystal. So it leaves the face middle in behind and grows the outside. So I've got an octahedron, I got in the middle there, I've got uh, a cubic crystal with a hole in it. And finally, if I grow it so fast, I only end up with one face of the crystal that's left and basically it's the thing that's coming up the side. If I come to the upper left-hand corner, if I just took one of those little, now it looks like a pyramid or a triangle, that's what's left over. So the question is, what does that tell me about gold crystals? It tells me they have to grow really fast. So I'm gonna to go to an experimental laboratory and I'm gonna ask how fast do these big gold crystals grow? And the answer is a few minutes. So we have this spectacular gold crystal that grew in a few minutes. Why did it grow in a few minutes? If I have a solution and it has gold in it and it's able to do that, what happened? Well, if we really wanna be sophisticated and confuse everybody, we say it's an EHPH problem. But the fact of the matter is, it means we change the pressure of the system suddenly. So almost all the gold crystals, these large ones that we see, occurred because we had a sudden change. And guess what? We had to put some seismology in the talk. So when we have a big earthquake at depth, we create a sudden release of pressure and we often grow gold crystals or gold deposits. So in fact, it's a great exploration tool. So go back to these great crystals. The one, largest one that's at the end of my hand there weighs about 180 grams. So that's you know, on the order of uh, something like seven ounces of gold. 
And that happens to be a crystal form, which uh, I call a texahetrahedron. I'll talk about it just in a moment. But the other, all single parts of, of crystal. And now we know they grew really fast. So what is the geologic story that's going on here? Well, they're in Brazil and they're along uh, the Bolivian-Brazilian border. If I come over to the map of South America on the far left-hand side, I see uh, black areas. Those black areas are former cratons, the middle of continents. And we know through different times, these continents have been collided and they've been supercontinents. The most famous, of course, is Pangaea, but there are many that have been formed. What happens when we make Pangaea? We have to have subduction zones come together and bring two continental masses and collide. These are the areas where we see these great gold deposits. And so I put these back together. You can see the craton pieces between South America and uh, Africa. And we're gonna go and look at the uh, Amazon craton and realize we're actually using the gold then because it's there to tell us another forensic clue about how our plate tectonics has behaved in the past. So when they collided, they made a volcano and that volcano reconcentrated the gold and it got deposited perhaps as those crystals, which were made in a few minutes at most. When did that happen? Well, we can go look at the craton and we know that this particular area that this gold crystals came from was 800 million years ago. So these are some examples of uh, gold. The one over on the left-hand side is gold from uh, the Silverton area and the Idorado mine. And uh, the middle thing to see there is a vein in the Idorado and these are things that have suddenly occurred in the gold crystals that formed uh, in that time. And this was, of course, in the San Juan Mountains in uh, Colorado, was when we had an episode of great uh, volcanic activity. And that volcanic activity was related to a subduction zone a long ways away, but we had a, a slab basically disappear. So we put it out there. We've got these great gold crystals, but we have 800 million years to go. What happens? We have erosion. When we erode, the rocks go away, but the gold doesn't. And so it moves downstream and we actually make placer deposits, which is where most gold uh, before the 1930s was found. In fact, the most famous gold rush of all that affected the US and was the great uh, California rush of 1849. On uh, January 24th in 1848, James Marshall, working for a guy named Sutter, discovered a couple of gold flakes along with a couple of other workers at Sutter's Mill on the American River. Found six of them. And he decided to divide those six into two parts. Three went with him and three went with his uh, foreman, which was a guy named Weimer. And up there in that little tray is the Weimer nugget. And when Weimer took it home, he was supposed to figure out tests to show whether it was gold or not. And so his wife boiled it in her soup for three days. I don't know what was so bad about her soup that it was supposed to dissolve the gold. But he came back with that and proclaimed it must be gold. And we're really lucky we still preserved that nugget. So let's go back to South America. What's happened is all the rock is completely eroded. That was formed 800 million years ago and made a laterite, or what we call in economic geology, a saprolite. And that saprolite makes a clay, and the only thing that's left in that clay is some gold nuggets. What you see on the left-hand side is in 2017, where these gold were found, and you could just see that the rush here, everybody's digging tunnels straight down. They're not following a vein. They're simply hoping they run into gold. A truly spectacular chance, but it's like playing the lottery. So these are golds, again, of Mato Grosso, individual crystals. What they're telling us is something about how our solar system formed, how we got something redistributed, how we had a collision process, and what happened during that collision process, and finally 800 million years of erosion. So the gold was formed a long time ago. It took a trip to the Earth mainly by meteorites after the earth was formed and then formed these gold crystals. And what we're looking at is something that records the full history of the earth. 
We pick gold as a forensic thing to tell you that we're sort of unique. If you think we're gonna find gold on any other planet in the solar system, you're probably crazy. We just have perfect conditions to be able to do that. But think about having to have a neutron star, collide with another neutron star, spew this material out, collect it, find a way to put it right in our solar system on a planet that has plate tectonics and had other meteorite impacts so that we could get a little more gold to create these crystals that we put before. So if you have a wedding ring or you have a chance to have a new gold uh, specimen that you get to hold in your hand and you think a thing of beauty, you should think a thing of earth beauty. Our DNA evolved just as much as what the gold's DNA is telling us about the earth. We are a product of our evolution on earth. And so I think if uh, everybody wants to go to Mars, I say that's really kind of dumb. We're evolved from Earth. We should figure out what we're doing with our own DNA. So I'll close with that, with this number of miracles that are required to make a gold crystal that we see today that actually is letting us peer into the very beginning of the universe. Thank you very much. OK. Am I up? I tried to make sure I gave Michael enough time. Okay. Am I, are you hearing me now? I am. Okay, so we've had a few questions in the chat room. Let me ask you, Terry, uh, what drives the rotation of the solar system? Why don't they just collapse? What uh, so that's a really good question. And uh, we can actually, it's a, it's a multi-bodied physics problem. And when you take lots of particles and you allow gravitational attraction, every particle is going to be attracted to every other particle. And it turns out that when you have a random distribution like that, as you begin to pull it together, this particle is most attracted to the one next to it, but it's still feeling something from a far side together. And so it causes a torque. And that's what causes the, the basically the spiral into the center of the universe or the uh, solar system. Uh, it's a great senior level a uh, physics question that you get asked to solve before they give you your degree. Okay, we had a second question. Uh, what's the proportion of placer versus hard rock mining for gold? Is there just a little placer or is there a lot of it? So there's almost no placer left today. And so uh, most placer is hobbyist. And, uh, you know, I mean, people still find gold in the American River coming out the Sierras. But uh, most of the gold that's uh, found today is in low-grade deposits. The great Carlin deposits of Nevada, for example, uh, only have a few parts per uh, million in the rock itself. And so they crush a tremendous amount of rock and then use a chemical process basically to separate the gold. Okay. John Bethel, who's a geologist in our audience, says, why is gold often associated with pegmatites? Uh, that's a good question too, but of course, uh, you know, pegmatites, to remind those that may not always remember that, usually are a strong fractionation event, usually in a granitic intrusion. And uh, we don't necessarily always, or at least I don't know uh, why we necessarily uh, start this granitic, uh, I mean, this uh, pegmatite fractionation, but uh, just like um, we talked about before, the fractionation process usually um, concentrates the gold and then pegmatites are particularly known to have uh, sudden uh, pressure releases. So you grow really big crystals. So Dave London has shown that these beautiful tourmaline crystals that grow on pegmatites grow in a matter of minutes also. And again, it's a pressure question. So it's the same thing that gives you uh, the gold crystallization. Okay, someone named Tom, I don't know Tom who, were elements other than gold and platinum also ejected? So yes, they do uh, have a full spectrum, and that's a really good question. It's complicated by the physics too. If we look at the, the R process, remember that thing we did with uh, looking at how uh, elements are formed, uh, there are what we call islands of stability. And so they produce a, a group of elements much more than some others. And so rare earths should be produced just as frequently as platinum and, 
and uh, gold. But because of some other stability things, they are, they are not produced as much. All uranium that's formed is also produced uh, by uh, neutron star, neutron star collisions. Okay, along the same line, uh, Sue Thompson asks, why is gold much more abundant than platinum? So that's a great question. And um, it turns out that we, you know, platinum is actually more abundant in the, in the solar system or the cosmos than gold because of the, the even odd order of the uh, number of protons. But platinum is even more uh, siderophile, more, uh, has a stronger affinity for iron than gold. And so there's even more platinum in the Earth's core than there is gold. If you took all the platinum in the core and you put it on a surface layer of the Earth, it would be four and a half feet thick. Okay, uh, from Shelley J, who's in the middle of the screen right there. Hi, Shelley. Uh, she says, can you explain again why iron is the end of the road in, nu in nucleosynthesis? Okay, so, so think about it this way. I've got a couple jelly beans here and they've got a charge and they all got a positive charge, but they're sticky too. And so I can take some of that sticky stuff and I can stick those two things together because they're sticky enough, but they don't really like being there that much together because they're both got an electric charge, of a positive charge. And so I could take a couple more of those and do that. But pretty soon all that stickiness isn't enough to stop all those things from wanting to push apart. And so that's this balance between what we call the atomic force or the binding energy and the nuclear force. And iron is the last time it can do that. If we try to put any more below that, the nucleus becomes unstable. And so nucleus synthesis, squeezing something back into it in the traditional sense, uh, has a, basically a dead end when we get to 56 uh, protons. Okay, uh, no questions coming up right now, but we had a couple polls we were going to run in the beginning, Rebecca. We oh, I forgot to... about that, guys. Sorry. Okay, let's shoot up the polls on who we who's out there. I mean, I see your faces, but can you put that on the screen, Rebecca? The first poll. Okay, if you don't mind answering this, we'd like to see who you are and where you are and and what your geologic knowledge is, just so we get a temperature of the audience. So just Answer the poll for yourself and they'll tabulate automatically. And it looks like results are coming in. So we'll give folks just a couple moments to answer. If you've still got a, you still have a question, you can put it in the chat room and I'll put it to Terry. I'm very curious to see how these results differ from our in-person events, Michael. Well, I know there's not anybody from outside of Washington coming to our in-person events. And I know there's two Colorado geologists in the audience. I know them personally, so we're reaching to the Rockies at least. Okay, I think we're at we're at 79 precincts reporting. So I think we will go ahead and end the poll so you can see the results. So they'll pop up on your screen now. That's quite interesting. More than 43% uh, well, are outside our immediate area for Townsend and the county. Mm -hmm. For geologic background. about 60% have had some study in geology or practice as a geologist. Well, that's great. Thank you. Okay, a question from Jeffrey Tepper. What causes such large single crystals of gold to form in the Amazon deposits? So again, I think the crystals grow very rapidly. And so what, what makes it so you have single crystals versus like a cluster of crystals. And I think that's probably, you know, what you're thinking about when you talk about that. And I think that what happens is you have to be very, very fast. You know, a crystal grows and you could do this with a salt experiment. If you look at, you know, salt and you basically uh, let the water evaporate, the, you'll get little salt crystals. And it's, it's the same structure as what you see for gold. 
you got a flat surface and you got corners. And what we look at is we take another little tiny salt grain and add it to that crystal to grow it. And it turns out that what we're doing to see the size of a crystal is what minimizes the energy of the whole system. And so it turns out the minimum energy equation in this case was to grow large crystals by just taking the corners of these crystals and letting them grow out and become very, very large. So it's, a, it's sort of a thermodynamics equation that if you change the conditions a little bit, uh, maybe you would have got a different answer. Okay, Patrick, which I think is probably Patrick Pringle, but I'm guessing at that, says, could you form gold via the pressure release at the roots of a caldera eruption as opposed to the pressure release in an earthquake? Yeah, um, I prefer earthquakes simply because I'm a seismologist, but um, the fact of the matter, we, we see, you know, I mean, I think that most processes associated with uh, uh, subduction zones, we don't have what we would, I mean, we, we maybe get an earthquake signature. We have lots of fractures that uh, maybe are aseismic and lots of kinds of things in which we see sudden changes of pressure. And so I think that that's probably true. You know, um, I spent a lot of time in the San Juans, and if you look at the gold veins that are there and the cracks and fissures, um, they're, they're very much related to uh, looking like what you expect is a dike forces its way through something. And so what you do is, of course, open that crack as a tinsel rather than an earthquake crack, and that's uh, what probably deposits the, uh, the metals in, uh, in those environments. Okay. I think we've run our course here. Terry, I want to uh, tell you how much we appreciate you dialing in from New Mexico on this nice Saturday afternoon, probably down there. And I think we had a good experience for our first virtual lecture. So thank you very much, Terry Wallace. And thank you. Bye-bye. See you later. Thanks, folks. Have a great evening.